I'm doing pretty well. I am uh, got a good night's sleep last night. I'm feeling very fulfilled uh, from you know, a week's worth of good shows and all that kind of thing. Well, we first met um, at a... Uh, we, uh, Amanda and I first met at a Halloween party that she threw at this uh, at this beautiful sort of artist collective that she had moved into in the south end of Boston. And uh, a mutual friend had come to me and said, you've got to come check this place out. It's going to be a great time. I was sort of living way up on the northern side of Boston, very sort of like cut off from the rest of the city. So actually getting down to this party was my introduction to a whole other part of the Boston kind of art and music scene. You've never been there before. Yeah, I never. I mean, I had sort of explored it on my own, you know, here and there, very naively, you know, not really quite knowing where I was going. And then, having since been introduced to that section of the city and to many of those people, um, it, it, it basically just broadened my whole view and sort of scope of the city and what Boston had to offer in terms of that. And it was amazing kind of meeting all of these people that I, I didn't even consider may have existed this sort of like thriving, exciting, vibrant kind of artist community. Uh, with, you know, um, Amanda had invited all these different whatever poets and musicians and all there's all this crazy stuff. And for me, I just kind of like kind of waltzed into this new magical atmosphere. And the crowning, you know, point of the evening was Amanda seated at the piano playing these songs for people she just you know it was like okay ladies and gentlemen we've reached that point in the night and she sat down and plugged into this little like box of a speaker and um, <clears throat> and she played I think she played like sex changes in half jack girl anachronism caladrina and um, bad habit yeah and I remember just that overwhelming um, that sense you get when you have like a, a really deep, sincere kind of like epiphany where you go yeah. like, this is one of those moments in life that may never ever arise again. Yeah. And I had that kind of, you know, movie screen, extreme close up feeling where I was like, oh, this is really Wayne's bizarre. Wayne's yeah, Wayne's yes, <laughs> very, yeah, sort of like, wah, um, the heavens kind of parting kind of feeling. And um, I realized that this is the exact vehicle for what I wanted to do, you know, from every level of, you know, artistically to musically and uh, where I visualized, I had that sort of sense of life flashing before my eyes kind of thinking, like, this person, what I'm witnessing, the way they are conveying their music and playing this instrument is exactly the kind of person I've been looking to, like, match with and so I really sort of you know calmly shyly at the end of the night sort of said I really liked what you did and think your music's great and you know if you ever want to play with a drummer or something like that you know get together uh, you know give me a call and so we exchanged numbers and um, and two other guys that night had approached her too and said oh I love your stuff I want to work with you yeah. and she had she, her uh, her thought was to actually work with the other guys and so she jammed with these other two people and came back and was like sort of nah, 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 and we had set our date to play for about a week after the party and uh, I was looking forward to it the whole week and had like went out and like you know I made some food and like got all this like rad stuff together and was good like ready to like make a, a great night of it and uh, wound up getting to the practice space we agreed to meet at like you know 7 30 yeah. and she was like 40 minutes late and I was like what the fuck and I like jumped <laughs> on my skateboard and rushed down to our house you know, this was like, you know, five miles away and I was on the train and thinking like, I hope I catch her, this is so weird. I had no cell phone, there was no like, it was just all guesswork. And literally skating down her street, I see the headlights pull up of the Volvo and she gets out of the car with her friend Steve, our friend Snafu, who's like working with some ton of stuff. And I was like, oh God, I got gotcha. you. What about practice? And she goes, oh, right, sorry. Uh, Bye, Steve. Thanks for the ride. Uh, let me just get my keyboard and we'll go. I was like, ah! and so anyway, so we wound up getting back down to the space. And by the end of the night, having played together, we were sort of jumping up and down, yeah. going like, "This is it." And I kind of had that affirmation of like, I, my gut didn't steer me wrong. I knew this was going to go well. And it was the same for her too. The first thing we played together was Sex Changes, and she sort of said, "Why? Well, I, I mean, what do you want?" To, I said, "Just play whatever you've been working on." And I just kind of listened for a minute and then 
started playing what came into my head. And she stopped after about a, like 30 seconds of singing. She kind of looked up and I said, is, is it okay? Like, do you like what I'm doing? And she goes, yeah, I can, I can tell like you're good and this is gonna be okay. And I was like, all right, awesome. And then from there we just, so we both instantly knew. And then after that, it was just like a, like a year and a half of this amazing honeymoon period of getting to be friends, playing music for each other. I brought my little practice drum kit over to her apartment. We set up in the bedroom, like facing each other, and we just play for hours, not even working on specific songs per se, but just jamming and working out ideas and kind of developing our own language and communication. And yeah, that's, that's really where it all came from. Yeah, certainly. I mean, and it's, she's, I think, in a different transition period now, too. I always knew that I wanted to do this for a living, and Amanda did as well, but she will say, I, when I was 24, I wasn't ready to make the commitment and yeah. make the jump and break away from my kind of carefree, bohemian performance artist lifestyle. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to try to change her, but I'm also not going to wait around and waste yeah. time. There's no time to waste. I've got to get doing this. Concentrate on Yeah, music. basically. And so after about a year of playing together, and I, I noticed her her interest not waning, but just sort of like not uh, reaching the level and the standard of commitment that I really wanted from like yeah. a, a bandmate. I sort of said, hey, listen, this is cool, and go ahead and go to your, tr your trips to wherever you're going and do your thing, that's fine, but I gotta, I'm gonna join this other band. And she sort of went like, <gasps> and you know, uh, that's what sparked us doing our first five song demo. Okay. She said, well, if you're gonna leave the band, then we have to go record everything we've done so far. And I said, okay, I'll agree to do that. Anyway, so what happened was the band I was auditioning for wound up taking their old drummer back. We went and made the five song demo and she was like, okay, I'm ready, fine. I get like, <laughs> I get the drift. And, uh, and that was it. And then after that, I, I had no idea. She just absolutely like steamrolled. The whole thing snowballed. And she went from being a sort of, you know, whimsical, you know, you know, arty, minded, you know, well, just impulsive kind yeah. of person to being extremely focused, like laser beam um, minded kind of person and started booking shows, making flyers, developing the whole Rolodex of people and really, um, you know, just kind of like blew past what I expected to see from her. Definitely. Yeah. It was incredible and really um, gave the band its its track that we began on because not only was she dedicated to developing the sort of visual and musical aesthetic, yeah. she had a really strong business sense, yeah. which was a very fortunate situation. Most artists are kind of good at one thing or the yeah. other, you get these personalities. Yeah. Exactly. But Amanda, and she was um, very dedicated to kind of developing her, her business acumen and reaching out, and she constantly would find people in the industry to, you know, pick their brain, ask questions, learn, find new resources. And that gave the band a huge tactical advantage, I think, against a lot of the other Boston bands who were just kind of like, well, we have a lot of our friends who come to shows and we're doing okay here and here, blah, blah, blah. But paired with Amanda's business sensibility, we also had a press angle. Um, I was explaining this the other day to somebody, they said, how did you sort of come about in Boston? And we got our first press articles because of Amanda's performance art and doing the living statue stuff. She would get interviewed and it would be like, oh, Amanda Palmer, you know, performance artist, living statue in Boston, also has this little band, the Dresden Dolls, go, go see her perform in Harvard Square, blah, 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 and her band is playing it so-and-so. Yeah. And later on, the article shifted away from the performance art, which she kind of phased out, and the band worked its way in, and because we had, um, interesting looking photographs, the press people in Boston, the music journalists were like, oh, finally something like, you know, not just like another kind of like indie rock shoegazer band in like, you know. Something more type of Yeah, definitely. Interest. I mean, it was like visually arresting too. There was nothing really that kind of looked like that. And it was all just fun too. It, it never ever felt like um, some kind of gimmick or whatever. She and I both, after we played this show with a burlesque troupe, and dressed up for it, went, God, what an amazing tool to draw on, this kind of added visual bonus. We started using it in our first press shot, and we both went, we both loved the 1930s aesthetic, we both loved that Rocky Horror Picture Show, yeah. flapper kind of, yeah. you know, ambiguous sexuality, and playing with gender role, and, and wearing makeup and stuff like that, and it just felt really natural, so, you know, and I loved the kind of like old jazz guys, and yeah. the bowler hats, and you see that kind of style, and 
you know, she always loved to don the sort of lingerie and the kind of <laughs> vamp kind of look. It just fit with the mood. Yeah. And um, and then um, drawing into Amanda's artist ties, we had an immediate collection of um, painters and photographers to help yeah. us too. So again, it was all about pulling those resources. No, definitely not as well planned. Uh, it was a lot more minimal. I mean, we started off playing in sort of jeans and t-shirt and then made the move to wearing a, a bit more of a costume. Um, but I think there was always that sensibility, that whole aspect of our show with the performers and the sort of multimedia stuff stemmed from those house parties, that yeah. very same kind of house party, box parties as they were called, this shadow box uh, was, was the name of it, like this sort of shadow box collective and um, so Amanda would always have different things in different rooms of the house going on and so when we started playing big enough clubs that literally just followed yeah just thing. just sort of like translated over into the rock club and instead of being like you know the bathroom on the third floor it was the bathroom of the venue that you'd yeah. find some weird you know violin <laughs> playing you know who knows what anyway um, but fortunately too I mean we went through a, a pretty long weeding out process of finding you know, some people who were like tremendously dedicated to wanting to be a part of the show but didn't quite have it together enough to make it like substantial enough yeah. for an actual performance through kids who just kind of wanted to get into the show and were yeah. doing anything to really established performers, uh, great people like Vaudevere, Skip Shirey, Reggie Watts, um, you know, on and on. Gravity plays favorites, great, you know, burlesque troupe out of Missouri. People like that who really had their act together and were very additive. That was always the main focus was trying to find something that would be additive to the show yeah. and not just sort of superfluous yeah. and, and, and sticky looking, so but that takes a while to get.